Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Anna Quinlan always writes about the issues that affect the lives of Americans. She's got a bi-weekly column in Newsweek uh, writing about Iran and Iraq and the war on terror. She's also somewhere in there written five novels. The latest one is called Rise and Shine. It's nice to see you, Anna. Thanks it's for coming good to back see to you talk again. With us. We'll get to the novel in just a moment. I want to talk to you about some of the stuff that's going on politically. Uh, we've been mentioning the president's going to be giving up a press conference today, kind of pitching again uh, the strategy in Iraq and why he thinks it's important. Uh, what do you make of this? And, and do you think at, at the end of the day, the midterm election will really be a referendum on Iraq? I don't know whether the midterm election will be the referendum, but we've already had the referendum. The American people seem to be um, pretty solid in their opposition to this war. The sad thing is that we all know how this is going to end. We're going to leave probably later rather than sooner. Iraq is still going to have massive problems, and many, many more people will have died than needed to die to remove Saddam Hussein from power. Um, you know, the president can do these whistle stops until the cows come home, and that's going to be the bottom line. Well, we have given up some of our privacy. The question is whether we have national security. And I think that many people would answer no. I, I don't think most Americans would tell you that they feel materially more safe today than they did five years ago. I wanted to write a novel about appearance and reality, which is so huge in America now. I mean, we have this sense that if things look good, you know, they are good. Um, and uh, we all know in our heart of hearts, on our home fronts, that that's not necessarily the case. I mean, this is a novel about two sisters who love each other very much, but at some level may not know each other as well as they think they do. We've lived together through the greatest political and social revolution in the last century in this country, and that's the rebirth of feminism. And the subsequent extraordinary changes in the lives of women like us, and our daughters and granddaughters and sons and grandsons too. When I was growing up, there were no girls playing in Little League. There were no altar girls. Most big law firms had never had a female partner. Most hospitals had never had a female surgical resident. There were no women in the Senate or on the Supreme Court, and Great Britain had never had a female prime minister. I could never have imagined how different my world would be now at age 50. I could never have imagined that I would sit up here and watch a woman who sells engines as big as my house be honored <laughs> at an event like this. I could never have imagined that we would come to take that for granted, that we would take for granted female cops and firefighters, female rabbis and ministers, female senators and judges, female partners and surgeons, female editors, and female columnists. I could never have imagined the day that I was driving with my boys when they were little back from their pediatrician's office, their pediatrician being one of my longtime close girlfriends. And Chris would say to Quinn, when I get big, I might want to be a doctor. And Quinn would reply, Oh, don't be stupid, Christopher. Only girls can be doctors. <laughs> Maybe the story of three girls will make this a little bit clearer and more concrete. The first of them had parents who came to this country from Italy. Her parents were strict and they were certain about certain things and so was the girl. She knew that if there was money for college, which there wasn't, but if there was, it would, would be her brother who would get to go, even though her art teacher said she had talent and should go to art school. But her parents expected her to get married, which she did when she was 19, and to have children, which she did, five in all, and to never work outside of her home, and she did that too. But sometimes she showed her children a portfolio she kept in her bureau drawer of her watercolors. And when she sent them to school with bag lunches, sometimes she painted on the shells of their hard-boiled eggs. If she had other dreams, bigger dreams, she never spoke of them, and neither did any of the other women she knew. The second girl was her daughter. She was raised as her father's oldest son. When she got B's, he told her that they should be A's, and when she had A's, he asked why they were not A pluses. 
she always knew that she would go to college, but there were lots of colleges that she couldn't attend because they were only for guys. Princeton and Yale and West Point where you could go to college free. She looked around her at the people who ran the country, and they were men, all of them, the members of the Supreme Court, the members of the Senate, the people who worked at and ran businesses like some of the businesses represented here today. No matter what dream she had, she was told that it would be harder for her because she was a girl, but she decided that, that was just too bad and that to show them she would be so much better that no one would be able to take her less seriously than her male counterparts. The third girl is her daughter. She's 14 years old, and she lives in a completely different world than her mother did as a child. There are indeed many women at Princeton and Yale and at West Point, too. There are 13 women in the Senate, and there are two women in the Supreme Court. Her doctor is a woman, as is her dentist. She takes for granted that women work. In fact, she thinks women run the world. It would never occur to her that her two brothers are more entitled than she to do anything, from college to a career in science, law, or medicine. Well, what you've just heard is a family tree. That frustrated artist was my mother. The girl who was pushed hard by her father was me. And the 14-year-old is my daughter. All by ourselves, Prudence Pantano, Anna Quinlan, and Maria Krovatin show just how much the world has changed for women. But it's important for me to say in a venue like this one that it's not different enough. There are various definitions of success that you will encounter out there. I mean, by the world's definitions, for example, I am a success. By my own definition, I am a success too, and here's why. Because I have a really happy family, and I have three fantastic kids who I'd rather hang out with than anybody on earth. Is it nice that hanging on my walls a plaque that says Columbia University gave me the Pulitzer? You bet it is. Would that be um, really important to me if my three kids were in bad shape? It wouldn't mean a thing. So if success looks good to all those days out there, but it doesn't feel good when you wake up in the morning, it's not success at all. The, o the only success that matters is, you know, if you can put body and soul together, if you can pay the rent and, and you know, buy food and take care of your family in a decent fashion, then the success that's important is the success that feeds your soul.